But basically, I've been, I want to share with you the concept of social entrepreneurship, what is uh, social impact and entrepreneurship. Where, where do they both meet? And, and what about in social innovation? And I didn't know I had an innovative life, but I was asked to talk about my innovative life. So I want to share this with you, and, and please bear with me. This has been the cause of my life. Poverty in my country and around the world. And since I was a little boy, I've always been very, very concerned why I was not born in this zip code. What, what, what happened? Why was I not born there? And their, their life is so, so different. And I have had the privilege of knowing this family, the Guerrero family, and getting to know the boy who's third on the right with a green cap. His name is Jorge. This is my family. I've had a beautiful, nurturing family of role models, support, emphasis on education. I have, I've been given everything without deserving. So this has been the contradiction in my life. And so when I finished, um, recognize this guy? <laughs> so when I finished high school, I said, I better get out of my comfort zone. I better, I was very curious. And I said, what, what is it like out there? What, what, I've been so protected and nurtured. And so I joined the army. Uh, and uh, I went to the desert, and I had been playing rugby before that in high school, so I was a good soldier, and an American colonel one day showed up in my base, and he said, would you like to go to West Point? I said, what? So I was offered the scholarship to go to West Point, and I almost went, went to West Point as one of those international cadets until the dictator in my country saw my name and said, not under my dictatorship. So that was the end of my military uh, <laughs> career. So then I wrote to 100 universities around the world asking for a scholarship because we could not afford an American university. And one answered. And it was the University of the Pacific in California. And I went there and I was very, very lucky because I met my wife there. So my bad luck in the army was my good luck in college and it was her bad luck. <laughs> because then I found out that she did not want to go to the University of the Pacific, but rather Stanford. Her great-grandmother had gone to Stanford as the entering class. Her grandparents, her parents had been, and then so some strange thing of, um, what, what is it called? Affirmative action. She could not go to it. So she was sent to the University of the Pacific. Your bad luck, my good luck. <laughs> and so we have raised a great family. We have a great family, and um, we're, we're just blessed with, with everything one can imagine. And when I came back to Paraguay, I studied public administration, I studied public policy, I studied energy policy, I studied economic planning, and I was part of that group of people that are going to come back to South America and reform government. The same dictator was still in place. <laughs> so he remembered me and he says, not under my dictatorship, you're not ever going to do government reform. So I had this problem, do I stay or do I return to the United States? And I said, I'm going to try to stay here, but I can't practice public administration. So by pure chance, I started the country's first NGO and with it the country's first microfinance program to help uh, weavers like her, right? The beauty of a microfinance program is that she, being poor, no collateral, no credit history, can't read or write, but she has dignity. And microfinance works not because of finance, but because of dignity. You trust her, she'll trust you back. And this has been a tremendous, a tremendous uh, awakening for, for many, many people. So after um, running this program for many years, I decided, but we need to change public policy. We need to take over the government. So as soon as the dictatorship was over, I said, now is my turn, public policy. That's what I remember in my sophomore year. Public policy. Get over to government and dictate policy and the rest will follow. So I ran for office and had the bad luck of being elected mayor of my city. <laughs> I thought it was just a matter of just putting everything in place Right? And I forgot what happened today or last, what happened today 
or last uh, yesterday in Egypt. Aha! Uh -huh. When you live in Latin America, every once in a while there are coups and revolutions. So here I was. <laughs> I was mayor trying to do public policy a la Americana, just very mission, objective, program, activity. <laughs> and this is, I was confronted with this reality, among which was, for example, um, they, the, there was a murder. They blamed the president. Um, the people, just like in Egypt, went to the Central Park to you know, demand impeachment. And the president did what any normal president would do. He called the tanks. So I, I said, well, we need to defend these, this is gonna be at Tiananmen Square. So I got the city garbage trucks and the caterpillar tractors to surround the building of Congress and attack the tanks. It was not really the caterpillar tractors that did the trick, but the garbage trucks. <laughs> so we saved the building of Congress. Eight students were killed, 300 were wounded, but the president resigned the next day and democracy was restored. So that was... Uh, the, 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 pow, the power of bad smells, right? So after that, I said, I better go back. This public policy thing has its limitations. So I better go back to, to the foundation. And right there, just that year, they, 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 there was this bankrupt agricultural school and the, the Catholic congregation that was running it said, Martin, would you like to run this school? And we said, but, but we don't do agricultural education. Yes, but you have something that nobody has. You have loans for the graduates and you have entrepreneurial education for the youth. So we took over this school and we said, oh, why don't we just apply the, what we've learned in microfinance that if you bet on the dignity of, this, of the people, of the, in this case the students, you can make it work. And so we turned an agricultural school that was based on the typical learning by doing, you know, theoretical classes, taking in very, very, very poor boys and girls. In this family, they live with under a dollar and a half a day. And Maricel is the girl, the second to the right. And through classes, theoretical and classes, change the educational system as we know it. Teach relevant classes and not just rote memorization. And through this thing, um, we uh, brought in, we, we asked every professor to run a break-even business. And so the poultry professor ran a profitable chicken coop and the food industry professor run, ran a profitable yogurt uh, 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 business. And so the school generates $300,000 a year and covers 100% of its budget without government subsidy and without charity. So, and so the message is counterintuitive. That's where innovation is. And so this is really interesting. And I got this visit from two BYU graduates. Out of the blue, knock, knock, hi. Uh, can we talk to you? Yes, come in. My name is Dave. Hi, Dave. My name is Jennifer. Hi. <laughs> and you are? Oh, we're, we're from Utah. We're actually from California. Okay, have a seat. Let's talk. Um, we have friends in Mali and in India. Would you like to go to India or Mali? What did I do to you? I mean, you, you, you know. <laughs> Would you like to go to Mali and in India and take your model of self-sufficient schools there? It wasn't our idea. So through their inspiration, we went to Mali, we went to India, and we found out that the problems of poverty and joblessness in Paraguay was the same. These are the same boys and girls that need a quality education but can't get it. So we started an international network called Teach a Man to Fish, and now we have 2,000 members from 119 countries, and we have 60 organizations that are in the pipeline wanting to replicate this model. And uh, here comes BYU again. 
BYU students are helping them and us do the business plans to get these schools to be self-sufficient. So this is how your loss is my gain <laughs> sometime and vice versa. So remember the girl? This is what happens when a girl who is born under extreme poverty graduates from a self-sufficient school. Since she paid for her education through her learning by doing and earning and selling, she is the master of her own destiny. And with, they throw this gala dinner to surprise their barefoot parents who come and pick them up on graduation day after three years. And what basically she has shown us is that this is what happens when people quit being poor. Because everybody is fighting poverty, alleviating poverty. But what, what is the actual photograph of a girl not being poor anymore? Ha behaving like the Joneses. <laughs> being, wanting to be middle class, you know? This is what happens, and this is what we aspire for all the poor people in the world, and I know some Marxists won't agree with me, but we want them to be of the bourgeoisie. We want them to enjoy the benefits of middle class. That's what we want. And yes, we are very concerned about the existing class structure, but we do not believe in the dictatorship of the proletariat. We believe in graduation into the middle class. But we do not believe in the capitalism that keeps the status quo. We want to have capitalism with a soul, capitalism with compassion, capitalism with, 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 with a feeling to give ample opportunities, not only for businesses to have ample opportunities, but for people all, all over the world. And so this is what we're trying to do. So she can be raised and born in a family of less than $2 a day, and she can become a young professional. And he, Jorge Guerrero, can go to college. He's about to graduate in agronomy, and he already owns his own business. So he's not poor anymore. He's, he's, poverty does not exist in his DNA. And so this is what we are trying to do. This is the problem. The women who are condemned to wash clothes in a contaminated river, to fetch water, to look for firewood all the, all the time, you know, no time for themselves, you know? How do you get this poor woman in Latin America or in Africa or in Asia out of poverty? Our idea is that Poverty is not only income, but employment, education, culture, housing, health, environment, participation in civic affairs, organization as a group, spirituality and interiority and motivation. And with the Piri Foundation, we are analyzing what it takes for people to get out of poverty. And again, here comes BYU. I was at a meeting at Sundance uh, Village one day, and I met Todd. And I said, Todd, do you remember me? Yeah. This is Joseph Grenny. He's the author of a great book called Influencer. Tell me more. And Joseph Grenny said there are two answers that people must answer in order to change. <laughs> what? Is it worth it? And can I do it? That's interesting. And is it worth it translates into motivation. And can I do it translates into skills. And so we are using this methodology to find six sources of influence on people so that they can change themselves. And we also bumped into some psychologists that introduced us to the integral theory, saying that you can explain everything, all the world, through looking at, at these four quadrants. The person's behavior, the person's system where they live, or this is external, or internal, her culture, or her personal intention. And so the idea is her income can be different from her uh, diet. And so why doesn't she have any teeth? Now we know why she doesn't have any teeth. It's either her, her behavior, 
she's not going to the, she doesn't take care of her teeth or she does not go to the dentist. Why? For lack of money? We'll give her a loan. But maybe she wants to go to the dentist, but there is no dentist. So we have to change the system. We have to create a clinic in that village or that slum. But how many people have gone and put a village in a slum and nobody goes? Because it could be the culture, right? Maybe if you're over 50 at that age, who cares if people have teeth? And what's the fourth? The forgotten fourth. Her intention. Maybe she's afraid. Maybe she's afraid. And maybe that is the reason why most people in the slums never go to the dentist. They have this image that it's going to be a very painful experience. So if they can not go, they don't go. And we are all better off knowing that in order to work with the poor. Where are they coming from? What are their values? How are they going to change the world? And so we have been working with that, and we are very, very uh, encouraged for the next 20 years of what we're going to be discovering there. And we have developed a poverty map of villages, whereby red is extreme poverty in such an in, in indicator. Green, uh, yellow is poverty, and, and green is non-poverty. So we are having the poor themselves measure their own poverty level and make their own plan, and this is what we have. These are girls from the poorest families of the world who can do a business plan, who can educate themselves, and who know where they're going to go. So this is, I don't know if this is innovation or not, but it's sure a lot of fun. It's sure a lot of fun. So thank you for having me here.